Legion. This week, Andronicus 2. Hello, and welcome to Roman Empress Totalis Rankium. I am Jamie. And I'm Rob, and this is episode 161, Andronicus 2. He was a Roman Emperor. He was. He was. By the name of Andronicus, I Yes, believe. second of his name. Second Paleologos. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, second, uh, yeah. second son. He was all round a number two, I think. Uh, but we'll save <laughs> oh, judgments yeah. till the end. Yeah. So here we are, Romans. Uh, this is our first Roman episode after we had a bit of a summer break where you swanned off to America for a bit. So, uh, But we're back. We're back. We're up and running. So are you yep. ready? Shall we just jump straight into this, Jamie? Let's head first, toe first, whatever. I see you've got your notebook ready. Yeah, I'm poised. Good. Okay, we are going to start our episode on the second Paleologos in 1259. Got it. <laughs> Reminds me of days when you used to write all the notes down. I know. Then I realised yeah. why am I doing this. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a nice little record. Uh, March the 25th, to be exact. Oh, that's um, the date that Sherlock Holmes died. Is it? Buried near here, don't you know? Yep. Yeah. Uh, one of the few state funerals in the Victorian times. Uh, yeah. It was just him and Albert and Disraeli, I believe. Yeah. Victoria's funeral didn't count because that wasn't in the Victorian times. Oh, that's good. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't would it? No. Yeah. It must be really annoying. It's like, oh, my time's ended, so my funeral's not even in my time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough about royal funerals, because, I mean, I can't think of anything else to discuss about that, apart from Victoria's. No. Uh, anyway, yes. Andronicus, that's who we're talking about. He was born to Michael Paleologos and his wife, Theodora. I thought you were going to say Michael Palin. Uh, no, no, different, Michael. Uh, this is just months before the death of Nicene Emperor Theodore II that we did. If you remember, yes. Theodore II died of just, like, being a bit paralysed and very ill for a while. And yeah. he put his child, John, in charge. Uh, but he put his best friend, George Mausolon, in charge of his son. Yeah. And Mausolon was murdered, along with his brothers, in the uh, mm. in the church when they tried to hide behind various things and failed. Yes. Uh, yeah, and the coup took place. And all of this happens... When Andronicus is a small wee babe in arms, so he wasn't really involved. It could be safe to be said. Uh, so yeah, wouldn't have had any memory of this. Uh, when Andronicus was two years old, however, his father accidentally retook Constantinople whilst asleep. Way hey. yeah. You do crazy things when you sleepwalk. You do, right? you do. Uh, <laughs> so his father, Michael, was able to declare himself the Roman Emperor without people laughing at last. Which is nice. Uh, little yeah. Andronicus was declared co-emperor, but just oh. in a kind of, by the way, he's co-emperor kind of way. Um, yeah. He wasn't crowned. There was no big ceremony. It was just, yeah. It's saving money at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got to watch the pennies. Yeah. The kid's co-emperor. Remember, this day and age, co-emperor is the old Caesar. It is the, it's the heir. Uh, yeah. It didn't really mean you were co-ruling, usually. Uh, now, don't forget, the rightful emperor is still John, and John is still alive. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And John is about to have his 11th birthday. John had a really bad 11th birthday, if you remember. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, he did. He, yes, because he got quite he the was, present. He, he got two very, very blunt, no, probably quite <laughs> sharp presents. Blunt, sharp, who knows? Who knows? They were There were two presents involved, and neither were good. Yeah, he was blinded. Uh, and just to remind you, because this is going to come back, the patriarch at this time when John was blinded was Arsenios. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, Arsenios was not happy about the blinding of John. And uh, within the next few years, Michael was able to have Arsenios exiled, thrown out the office of the patriarch. For the ridiculous name. Uh, and for having a ridiculous name, yes. So just remember that that happened. It's not important now, but it comes up later. Okay. Yeah. So anyway... Andronicus, just like many royal children, we get very little about his childhood. Uh, presumably, he was well-educated and stayed in the women's quarters in the palace. Mm. This is common. I've said this a lot in recent episodes because they're just following a pattern. The next we hear about Andronicus is when he is finally formally crowned as co-emperor in 1272 at the age of 13. Actually, in the Hagia Sophia because they're back in the capital at last which is great. However, just because we don't know much about Andronicus at this time doesn't mean that it was quiet in the Empire. 
Uh, as we covered last time, this is around the rise of Charles of Anjou and the fighting that went on for years. But Andronicus at this time was probably too busy thinking about the fact that his father had just arranged a marriage for him. He probably mm-hmm. wasn't thinking too much about the big picture. He's around 13, 14 years old, and he's told, you're getting married, son. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. He is getting married to the 13-year-old Anna of Hungary. Oh. So, good good age difference there. It's yeah, not, to be fair, it could be worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh-huh. that's just a year between it. That sounds good. Uh, they're both quite young, but I mean, we've seen a lot worse in political marriages. Anna was mm-hmm. the daughter of Stephen V, the King of Hungary, who had just died. Mm-hmm. And she was also the sister to the current child king of Hungary. So as political marriages go, I mean, it's not the best. It's like, well, she's the daughter to a dead king of Hungary. It's not great. But as you Uh, might remember, uh, Michael, always looking for a way to solve things diplomatically. Very much a pen is mightier than the sword kind of guy. Makes sense. That's good. Yeah. So any ally uh, in the area, always good. We're just going to marry people off. Political marriages, left, right and centre. So uh, this is what happened. Fast forward five years. Um, We only know one thing that he did during this time, because Anna had their first child at around this point. So we can deduce something. Uh, They called this boy Michael Nine. Strange name. Strange name. A year later, they had another boy called Constantine. And some point after this, Anna dies. Oh. Yeah, we don't know how. We don't know when. Maybe childbirth, Childbirth, maybe not. You can decide, but you've got to decide quickly because uh, it happens soon. Uh, Visit to the zoo, um, they go and look at the hippos, one escapes, she gets trampled. Go. Cool. Trampled by the hippos or trampled by the people running away from the hippos? Oh, hippos, more comedy. Right, okay. (laughs) Quicker death as well. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Just head went like a melon. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Should have said that as you were drinking your tea, should I? (laughs) No, it's right. I'm trying to subtly drink it there, but it's all gone now. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, like her brains. <laughs> anyway, meanwhile, whilst uh, whilst he's busy having children and watching his uh, wife die horribly, horribly in a visit to the zoo, <laughs> his father gets some good news. Charles of Anjou has been deposed by a revolt on Sicily. Yes. The empire's major threat is gone. And uh, that's it. We've pretty much caught up with the end of last episode. Last episode was Brilliant. a long one, so I've yeah. breezed past a lot there. But I figure Andronicus wasn't really involved. We covered it all last time. Yeah. Uh, however, I say he's not too involved. He's old enough to be following his father around in the running of the Empire at this point. He's definitely learning the ropes. He's in his early 20s, so don't think small child anymore. Uh, yeah. Apparently, by this point, he was deeply religious. A very pious young man, okay. unwaveringly loyal to his father. Despite all the rumours. Despite all, well, it wasn't just the rumours, it's despite all the actions of his father, because oh. Andronicus was disturbed. He's disturbed by the actions of his father. Because if you remember last episode, Michael spent a lot of time and energy attempting to bring the East and Western churches back together. Yeah. Oh, we didn't like that then. Well, not many people did like that. Uh, In Michael's view, in defence, this is the only way to keep the Empire safe from the crusading obsessed Latin states. We've we've got to tie ourselves to them religiously, or they use the fact that we're orthodox to beat us with sticks whenever they can. Now, as I touched on last time, this caused a great rift within the city, and definitely within the church. Uh, There were those who were for unification. Mm. This is politically sensible. We've got to do something. However, most, a vast majority of people, were very much against this. The idea of having the Pope lording it all over them and then introducing his weird Western practices to their church was beyond awful. It was, it was heretical. It was mm. downright sinful. So they just didn't want any of it. Fair enough. Yeah. Andronicus shared these views. He oh. hated the idea of unification. If you remember, towards the end of last episode, I mentioned this caused splits within the royal family as well. Andronicus's auntie just leaves the palace because she's outraged by it. So Andronicus is very unhappy, but like I say, he was actually very loyal to his father. So he kept these doubts on the inside. That's, that's good. Yeah, that's... Dutiful son. Yeah. Is that kept quiet for now? For, for now, for now. Right. Yes, uh, as we saw with Charles out of the way... Michael still had some smaller battles to win, and uh, when he was off fighting John the Bastard, he became ill, and it was obvious he was going to die. So on his deathbed, he proclaimed 
but everyone already knew anyway. My son Andronicus will rule after me. And everyone probably went, well, yeah, it means you're heir. He's, he's the co-emperor. Yeah. So it's exactly what... You signed this 15 years ago, we know. Yeah. <laughs> Were you expecting a surprise? Shark looks? Do you want us to do shark looks? So it's your deathbed, <laughs> your choice. Whatever yeah. makes you happy. Sorry, did we say deathbed? Long <laughs> rest bed. <laughs> yes. And then he had a very long rest. Very long rest. He's still, still resting, resting to this day. <laughs> yes. And at the age of 23, Andronicus too becomes the sole emperor of the Romans. And he knows what he is going to do first. Stop the unification. Yes, but that is second. Oh, okay. That's as soon as I get back to the capital, I'm going to deal with that. They're off oh, on campaign. Uh, no, no. Um, well, the, the skirmishes are going on. Uh, but no, what he does first is he orders his father's body be taken from the bed in the dead of night and buried in an unmarked grave under some trees somewhere. <gasps> Why? So they don't have to carry it around? <laughs> it's quite literally a dead weight. Um <laughs> <laughs> No one wanted to be on emperor duty, that. It's like, oh, Jeff! it's just Jeff! heavy. Um, no, there are differences of it. opinions on why he did this. Uh, as you can imagine, according to one source, it's because Andronicus was disgusted by what his father had become and what his father had done to the church. And there's something to be said for that, because uh, apparently Andronicus was very pious and very devout to the orthodox church i I can imagine he was upset but uh, it doesn't ring true with the idea that he was very faithful to his father so it doesn't have to be now does he uh, well maybe that's it maybe he's now like i'm in charge now i'm gonna put you in an unmarked grave and i dance on it too if i knew where it was uh, but so he just goes out nice just dances around random trees yes (laughs) one day i get it (laughs) urinating in the odd place who knows? Actually, there is a benefit to that, isn't there? Because if you want to just be really awful, um, mm. it's like, well, I don't know where he is, so I can just go and dance somewhere. I'll pro- that's probably his grave. Yeah, I'll yeah. do. Yeah. Ah, screw that's, you. Well, that's one argument, not the weird tangent we went on. The argument that he did no, it because no. he was disgusted with his father. Uh, the other one, however, uh, it is argued by some historians that actually Andronicus was trying to save his father from humiliation here. He knew that the church, back in the capital, hated his father. Uh, Michael had technically died a heretic because there was a lot of arguments between him and the church. Yeah, yeah. So they, they weren't going to give him a proper funeral. Uh, they were going to get back to the capital and then what? We've got, we've got a dead emperor here. Um, they could and, still put in a marked grave, though. Just uh, like you, cast him into a tree. You like, could, but he'd made a lot of people here. upset. A lot of people would be dancing and relieving themselves. So perhaps it would be best just to avoid the whole thing, make the problem and the body simply go away. Nice and clean and simple. Yeah. Yeah. Incidentally, he does a few years later have his father dug up and brought back and buried in a better place, which... Well, that shows it's not... It either shows that he, he got bored of dancing... (laughs) <laughs> or yeah. it proves it's the second point. But anyway, yeah. Dad's in an unmarked grave for now, and then he heads back to the capital. He moves quickly because he knows exactly what he is going to do first. Now he's done the actual first thing he's going to do, right. which is... Stop the unification! Stop the unification, of course. He kicked the gates to the city down <laughs> and just shouted, Stop! And everyone just froze. It's a guy, guy, guy carrying bread. Yeah, yeah. A juggler, and all the balls just suspended in the air. Yeah, he's very, very devoted to stopping. It was great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, he was the emperor. Yeah, he was the emperor. Um, but then the, uh, then he said, the unification, and everyone took a relieved sigh. Oh. The juggling balls fell to the floor, and uh, everyone cheered. Hooray! Yes. Um, no, no more unification. We're going back on all of this nonsense, my father said. We are restoring the orthodox patriarchy to its rightful place as the true religion of the empire. Damn it. (laughs) So he formally recanted on his oaths to Rome that his father had forced him to make. Would that be a bit awkward or because it's something they will agree on? It's kind of like, ah, it's fine. Well, it's fine because they had something in place where he just took his hand out of his pocket and his fingers were crossed. And he Mm. just pretended that they were crossed the whole time over the last several years. There we go. So, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Um, But what if his dad said no take backsies, though? What happens then? There is no record of no take backsies. 
So I can only assume Michael forgot, which maybe we should have judged him on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, you do make a good point, though. Yes, obviously not everyone in the city is happy about this. There are some people who wanted the unification, such as the patriarch, John huh. Beckus. Beckus, very pro-union. He'd been put in place as a sign to the Pope that Michael was serious about unification. If you remember last episode, he was told in Leon, you've got to get rid of your patriarch because he's not pro-union enough. And Michael just did yeah. it. So yeah. anyway, John Beckus, he's got to go. Get him out. So they kick him out. Bye. Who are they, who, who they going to put in his place? Thinks Somebody the emperor. Anti-union, maybe? Yes, guess. someone anti-union, definitely. Yeah. And who better than old Joseph? Joseph! That's what they called him. That's old Joseph. It took a long time to talk about him because you had to really elongate that <laughs> old. Old Joseph. Yeah. Uh, this was the patriarch who had resigned in disgust at the idea of unification nearly a decade ago. Yes. So this would be a really good message to the people. Oh, Joseph, he's back. He's back. He hated unification and now he's back. How is Joseph doing, by the way, said the emperor? Is he still really old? Um, Well, actually, when he first became patriarch and he quit, he was only 23. So he's only 33 now. So he's doing all right. No, definitely not. Oh, no. We don't actually have his age, but he was old, apparently. Oh. (laughs) And... uh, Good news, bad news situation. Uh, (laughs) Good news, he's not dead. We've tracked him down. He is still alive. But uh, he has aged uh, roughly 10 years in the last 10 years. Um, Mm. You'd be shocked to to hear. And um, he's he's, he's a little bit weak. He's a little bit (laughs) frail. Uh, But, I mean, we can get him if you want. I mean, he won't be able to protest. Uh, Uh So, should we get him? Yeah, go and get old Joseph. So... They got him, they took him to the capital. Big ceremony in the heart. I don't want to be here! <laughs> Get the Give impression. Me back home. Get the impression it was a bit like that because ceremony yeah. in the Hajj of Sophia, uh, they had to carry him in on a stretcher. Give me up this bloody thing! <laughs> <laughs> back in my day! <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. We want it to be like back in your day. <sighs> oh, unification! No, no, we're not having it anymore. Oh, I'm cold. <laughs> Deirdre! No, no. <laughs> no, she passed years ago. Andronicus, I'm the new emperor. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, everyone knew, apart from possibly old Joseph, orthodoxy was back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> this was a good statement. Uh, and in case they didn't quite get it, anyone who had been mutilated by his father and imprisoned because of their opposition to unification, were released from the prison cells. Oh. If you remember, this was pretty much the only thing we were able to give approbium points to Michael, yeah. because he seemed fairly level-headed, apart from yeah. his persecution of the anti-union group. So do you think when they were released from the prison, they sort of, you know, when you like in, you, you get your stuff back that you went out in, with, like, oh, here's your wallet, here's your, here's your cutlery, here are your eyes... <laughs> Here's your left leg. I think so. There's your your nostril. Um, (laughs) Yes, that definitely happened. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, if you had something cut off due to your faith, it was your lucky day because you were pulled out of your cell, handed your bits in a bag and paraded through the city as if you were a hero. A martyr for your faith, in fact. So well done you. I got my Kong back. I got my Kong back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Celebrations all around. Yeah. Uh, everyone was very happy. Andronicus, much more popular than his father at this point. Great. Uh, however, as soon as people stopped celebrating, they started blaming. And anger started to spill over over what had happened to the church re- recently. Uh, namely, the ones who were really angry were the Arsonites. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. The what? The the arsonites. They were the arsonites. They they as as arsonites. I, they, they arsonites. They they got a bit arsy apparently. That's how you describe <laughs> it. Uh, they <laughs> they wanted revenge on anyone who was pro unification. Now the arsonites were named after the patriarch who I mentioned oh. not long ago, Arsenios. They believed that Michael had acted against God when Michael had exiled Arsenios. And therefore, all the patriarchs since him were false patriarchs. Some were even claiming that blind John IV was still the rightful emperor. 
John's still alive, by the way. Still alive? Yes. No, he, uh, this is only 20 years have passed. Yeah. Right. It's been 20 years since his blinding. So he's he's in a monastery now and he's been blind for the last 20 years. But yeah, he's still alive. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, Arsenites are going, no, John's the real emperor and Arsenios is the real patriarch. He's dead. Don't care. He's the real <laughs> patriarch. We've dug him up. Here he is. <laughs> Look, we've got old Joseph in right now. I mean, is it any yeah. different? Is it any different? We could have Arsenios back. <laughs> I miss my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you are never married, Joseph. <laughs> anyway, Andronicus, Andronicus was worried about the Arsenites. They were small but powerful. They had members high up in the church, and Andronicus could see how easy it would be for their anger uh, to stop being projected at his father and start turning upon him. So he attempted to placate the Arsenites. He gave them a church, a big church in Constantinople. So there you go, this is now an Arsi church. You guys can, you guys can I, I, hang here. Can you imagine the sculptures on the outside? <laughs> <laughs> Smooth, lots of marble, well rounded. Yes, yeah. rounded. Uh, very impressive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they, uh, yeah, they got a great church, uh, and then you'll be very sad to hear old Joseph dies. Everything's going dark. I'm yeah. getting cold. Or he just had a snooze for a long time and everyone just assumed he was dead. Uh, who knows? Yeah, I think he'll turn up at the end of the episode. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> the Arsenites loudly shouted, right, it's time for one of us to be patriarch. I mean, obviously, fine, we can't have Arsenios because he is actually dead. Uh, but oh, no. one, one of us, one of us, the Arsenite faction, we should now be patriarch. Uh, yeah, you need an arse as a patriarch. That's what exactly, you need. that's what you need. Andronicus didn't like the sound of this. Uh, he wanted to appoint someone he could trust, not a member of the slightly fanatical faction that trying to take over the orthodoxy. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of promoting an Arsenite, he promotes someone he could trust instead. The Arsenites were furious. So how about this, says Andronicus? How about we go and dig up the remains of your beloved Arsenios? Is Are they trying to make like a... Um, like he is now the... Uh, He'll forever be the patriarch, but he's dead. So it's, it's like a ceremonial thing, like a sculpture, like a... I don't know. I, don't, I know what I'm trying to say. I you, you, you're not words. far off. Um, Arsenios had been exiled and uh, he was he was just died and buried in shame. So yeah. the idea here is we'll go to where he is, we'll dig him up, we'll give him a really big funeral. Absolutely huge. Okay. Pomp, ceremony, it's going to be great. We'll pop him in a shrine and everything. We'll walk behind him for bloody hours and people will love it. Uh, <laughs> There'll be queues waiting to see queues, his coffin. Massive queues. 24 it's going to be hour queues. excellent. Uh, as, uh, yeah. People will be lapping this stuff up. Will that cheer you guys up? Uh, yeah. 24 hour news coverage. <laughs> non, non-stop. We'll, we'll hire someone. We'll get Roger in to just, just stand yeah. by that box and narrate non-stop about something that's not <laughs> happening. Nothing's yeah. happening. It's a box. But here, here be there, narrating. Yeah. How about that, Arsenites? And the Arsenites love this idea. It's fantastic. Okay. Oh, yeah, splendid. Great, but it's not quite enough to stop us causing you trouble over the next few years, they said. I'm still alive! Shut up. Oh. <laughs> they just hit him with a frying pan. That's when he died. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, and sure enough, this wasn't enough to stop him causing trouble because they caused him trouble. It caused Andronicus some trouble for the next couple of years. Uh, Andronicus was able to come up with a solution, however. Finally, he was able to placate the Arsenites by doing something quite extreme. He left his palace and he went to go and visit John IV. Ooh. Yes. He arrived at the monastery slash jail that the blind man in his early 40s now was uh, being kept. Uh, he sat down with the old emperor and apologised for the fact that his father had blinded John. Yes, I'm so terribly sorry this has happened. I mean. yes, and what do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, he sits with blind John, he apologises and asks for forgiveness. And then he asked if there's anything he could do to make his life more comfortable. Yeah, give him a bloody palace back. <laughs> but unfortunately, um, the source that tells us that this meeting took place and tells us what Andronicus said didn't bother to give us John's reply, which makes me think maybe John's reply was um, 
not deemed <laughs> suitable <laughs> no. for the history books. <laughs> Just over asterisks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Well, what would really make me comfortable is if you got a <laughs> up your <laughs> inside a. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so we don't get what John says, which is a shame. But still, this apparently was not enough. Andronicus thought this would sort it out, um, but no. The Arsonites were still causing a fuss, and they managed to force the Patriarch to resign. The Patriarch was accused of heresy. More pressure put on Andronicus to pick an Arsonite to be Patriarch, and again he resisted. In fact, he'd had enough by this point. Mm. He went the other way. If you're going to tell me to put an Arsonite in charge, I am going to put someone in charge who you hate. (laughs) So, he scoured the land for someone who could uh, become the Patriarch, He wanted someone who he could trust, but also someone who would be able to whip the church into shape. Now, Andronicus, like I say, a very pious man. He saw the riches of the Orthodox Church, and especially the Arsonites, as obscene. You're just doing this to make yourselves rich. Where's the core of our religion gone? Where's the love? Where's that bit about needles and squeezing camels through them and stuff? So, like, let's go back to roots here. Make it about Jesus. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they came across a monk named Athanasius. Good name. Athanasius. We've had that name before. Oh, we have, yes. It's a, a popular name. It's oh. not the same Athanasius. No way related. Uh, this Athanasius was a hermit who lived up a mountain. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I could find no evidence, and I did look, that he was a stylite. <gasps> In fact... It seems very unlikely he was because he did actually move around a bit and did things like uh, found monasteries and stuff. So he wasn't a complete recluse. But I I don't care. I'm saying he's a stylite. He he had a a pillar on wheels. (gasps) Mobile stylite. Genius. Yes. He's got a camel to pull it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. He throws little pebbles at it to get it moving. Go, go. Yes. Just like a weird squeaking (laughs) over the... A bit of dust falling from the... the wrong way, Clive! Wrong way! Yeah, no, no, yield! No, oh, no, turn right! Right! Ah. No, oh... Bl- bloody Clive. Um, yeah, very little is known about Athanasius, uh, apart from what we've just come up with. Uh, but we do know he was the kind of man who wore a hair shirt, literally. I mean, he, he would... Yeah, he, he didn't want to be comfortable. He wanted to be miserable all the time to prove how goddamn godly he was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he hated the wealth of the church and how it had accumulated. He instantly started stripping the richest churches of their wealth. As soon as he became patriarch, that was it. He's cracking down abyss. He'd walk around the city with a clipboard just going, well, you don't need that. You don't need that. No, it's not worthy of God. We are going back to roots. This is perfect for Andronicus. This man would anger the clergy so much, especially the Arsonites, that uh, they'd start arguing about him rather than arguing about Andronicus nice. not supporting the Arsonites. Misdirection, love it. Misdirection. So there we go. Very soon, Athanasius had done his job to the point he had to hire bodyguards so hits put upon him by those high up in the church wouldn't succeed. <laughs> I just think, like, one of his bodyguards would take a, an arrow to the neck, fall down and say, well, that's not very godly, is it? Take... <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, Things like that. Um, I should probably say I might be exaggerating here slightly. I didn't read anywhere that um, members of the clergy were actually trying to assassinate him. But, I mean, the guy had to walk around with bodyguards to stop him being stoned and stuff. I think it's safe to infer that he had made powerful enemies. So, there you go. Anyway, that's all the churchy business that's going on. Uh, That's what he wanted to deal with, and he's pretty much dealt with it. Unified Orthodox Church, sort of, apart from the pesky Arsonites. So meanwhile, uh, he gets married. Remember his wife died just before he became emperor? Yeah. In the tragic zoo incident? Mm. Well, time to get married to Yolanda. Yolanda? That's a great American name. Yeah, it's a great name. Uh, She changed the name to Irene, though. Come on, Irene. Da, na, yeah, na, na. yeah, that's a shame. Uh, Yolanda slash Irene was only 11 years old. Whoa. Uh, yeah, you see, this, <laughs> this isn't so good. No. She's younger than his first wife was. 
quite a few years ago. <laughs> mm. But obviously, political marriage, yet again. She was an heir to a family who, for many complex reasons, I'm not going to go into it, could claim to be the kings of Thessalonica. Thessalonica, remember, is the second city in the empire. It's sort of north of Greece, Macedonia area. That's where it is. Yeah. So the claim wasn't really serious by this point, but Andronicus saw it as a way to shore up support. Uh, he didn't want his second city to turn on him for any reason. And there were reasons that they might. Because although Andronicus had been focusing on dealing with the church and the issues surrounding it, and doing a relatively good job, he had been less attentive to the army and the things in the empire further afield than the capital. And everything was falling apart. Oh, yes. Due to the economy really starting to struggle, Andronicus had looked into ways of reducing spending. <laughs> Do we really need, he said, all of these mercenaries? We've got Constantinople <laughs> back now. We are now the major power in the region, sort of. Surely we can cut some costs here. We're paying for a lot of mercs. I, I can just imagine the panicked look of the general surrounding us. Like, no, no, <laughs> seri seriously, sir. These walls are only brick. Uh, I mean... No, uh, I'm no. disbanding them. They cost a fortune. Get rid of the mercenary groups oh, no. uh, that my father regularly used. Uh, and I'm not an idiot. We'll replace them. We'll replace them. We're just... Replace them with uh, new groups of mercenaries, but they're they're new, so they'll be cheaper. Yes, yes, those very green-looking ones there. Mm. Yes. So the he's holding his spear the wrong way around. That's the one. Perfect. That'll do. The one? <laughs> That's all we can afford. <laughs> It'll, do. It'll do. And the navy, he then said, and at this point all the generals just... <laughs> their faces sink even more. Ah, one weak spot, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, you know, the bit without the walls. That's the, that's what the yeah. navy do. Our city's surrounded three sides by water. Yeah. Well, anyway, please go on, sir. <laughs> yes. Well, if you remember, his father Michael had attempted to build up the navy rather than relying on the Genoese and the Venetians. Mm. Trouble was, it was nowhere near as good as those cities' navies. So, what was the point? Andronicus said, in paying a fortune to keep this navy up and running when if we ever have to use it, we will definitely lose. And you can see that logic. There's a logic to it, yeah. There is. It's like, it's rubbish and we're paying a fortune for it. And if we ever use it, it will be destroyed instantly. So, yeah, get rid of it. The entire Navy, sir? Yes, the entire Navy. What about the submarines? The, the, the what? <laughs> the, the boats have sunk already. <laughs> uh, the submarines. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, you might... Might be able to guess this was a huge mistake. But it wasn't so much them not having a navy, it was more the fact that suddenly there were a lot of sailors who needed employment. Yeah, you've now got And they have nowhere employment. to go. Yeah. So where are they going to go? To places where they would love a navy. Yeah, and who are these people just across the Bosphorus? Oh, the Turks. Maybe we might be able to find employment over there. Now, let's get you updated with what's going on elsewhere, shall we? The Abbasid Caliphate, which we've been talking in our series about for so, so long, uh, is now unrecognisable. The Mongols came through and they did bad things to it. Very bad things. In fact, the year before Andronicus was born, the great sack of Baghdad had occurred. Say uh, goodbye to the House of Wisdom and all the great stuff there. Yeah. Unimaginable damage to the future of civilizations. Think of the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Yeah. That kind of thing. <laughs> this yeah. is how we so, created numbers. This is how numbers work. <laughs> no. Yes. So that happened recently, so that's fun. Uh, the Turkish leaders from Baghdad had fled to many places, uh, including Anatolia. Now, the Sultanate of Rom, which, again, we'd been talking about recently, was also a mess because the Mongols had come along and done very, very bad things to it. So the area was sort of up for grabs, and the area just falls into warring Turkish factions. Now, the Romans held on to the very top left of Anatolia, and that's all they've got at the end of Michael's reign. And even then, this area is rapidly becoming made up of islands of Roman cities surrounded by Turkish countryside. The Karasi Turks were one of the biggest problems for the emperor because they were up on the border with the Romans. And so was one other faction. This is slightly smaller, uh, but this was led by a man named Osman or Othman. Mm. Othman will become Othman I, and he will have the fourth major caliphate named after him, the Ottoman Empire. Oh, I've heard about them. And they, oh, they yes. lasted until oh, yes. a long time. If we were ever to do the Ottoman Caliphs, 
uh, which has been suggested as like Holy Roman Emperor or the Tsars of Russia, but the other one that's often mentioned is the uh, Ottoman Caliphs. He would be our episode number one. Oh, he yeah, nice. So, um, big big man in history. That's what he is. But at the moment, he's just a man in charge of a small faction in the area. Anyway, these warring factions are just gaining sailors from the dismantled Roman navy at this point, so that's good. Yeah. Meanwhile, there was trouble much closer to home for Andronicus, because his brother Constantine, remember he had a brother? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was caught in the process of a coup. Constantine was thrown in jail, where he lived out the rest of his life, and that's all we ever hear of him. Fair so. enough. Well done, Constantine. You made your mark on history. (laughs) Not good, though, because Constantine had been leading the fight against the Turks. So uh, that's like one of his generals gone. But still, it's okay. He had a a better general than his brother, a general who's good on merit, not just because he was a family member. And this was Alexius. Alexius, Phil, in fact, don't remember the rest of his name because he's also staging a revolt. (laughs) Yes. Uh, This also came to nothing immediately. Uh, His men betrayed him and blinded him. Uh, But (laughs) that was uh, almost overnight. Andronicus's two leading generals gone. So uh, not great. And he couldn't afford to lose these generals. The fighting then came from an unexpected source. The capital found itself dragged into what can only be described as an incredibly embarrassing war. Oh dear. And it really highlights just how weak the Roman Empire has become. This is the kind of stuff that if you went back in time and pretty much told any other Roman emperor about, you'd be red around the cheeks. I died for this. Yeah. Right. The Venetians and the Genoese, as covered, did not like each other. Mm. Huge naval powers in the Mediterranean. Massive merchant cities. Very powerful. For the last few episodes, we have seen emperors trying to hire them and then keep them from rebelling and attacking. Well, the two warring city-states now decided to have a war inside Constantinople. What? Yeah, pretty much. You might remember that Michael gave a section of the city to the Genoese at one point, and this was called Galatia. If I'm I'm not pronouncing that right, I know I'm not, but it's spout G-A-L-A-T-A. There's lots of A's. <laughs> Galata. Uh, in 1296, 75 Venetian ships just sail up the Bosphorus and attack the suburb of Constantinople. Now, we're outside the city walls, but it's still by this point very much part of the city. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they just set fire to the warehouses and the harbours. Oh. So... The imperial troops see this and go and defend the area of the city. And yes, it was the Genoese area, but it's still part of the city. Mm. But when they go to protect it, the Venetians just turn around and attack the city proper. So lots of burning down of parts of the city happen. Andronicus, well, he knew what he needed to do. He wrote a stern letter to the Doge of Venice, he did. Uh, However, before the stern letter could be sent off, the Genoese in the city rose up and massacred all the leading Venetians who lived in Constantinople. Venice was outraged and the Doge sent a message to Andronicus accusing him of supporting the Genoese and demanding payment as compensation for the murders. At this point, I can only imagine Andronicus is going, uh, what? Uh, (laughs) It's nothing to do with me. You two are attacking each other in my bloody city. Yeah, get out. (laughs) All of it. Yeah. But the Doge also sent a fleet, another fleet that came up the Bosphorus and once more attacked and this time managed to kidnap a lot of people. Andronicus could do nothing. He was probably part relieved and part furious when in 1299 the Genoese and the Venetians signed a peace treaty that had nothing to do with him whatsoever. Mm. There you go. That was a small sort of war skirmish that happened within the city between two different states that had nothing to do with the Roman Empire. That's a bit... Yeah. What would Trajan say? Oh, he'd be dead. He'd never have let it happen. Like, he wouldn't have got to this. And if it had, Trajan probably would have rolled up his sleeves and went, right, let's sort this out. Yeah. I'll kill you all. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, what, what would Constantine the First say? What would Florianus say? Oh. What would yeah. Poopy Anus say? I, who knows? Who knows? All of them would be very disappointed in this. Anyway, things then get worse. Four years later, the news comes back to Andronicus. He's now in his early 40s, by the way. Uh, just keep track. Time has gone by. Uh, his son, Michael Nine, is now in his mid-20s. 
he had just suffered a humiliating defeat against Othman. Now, I'm not going to go into details here because Michael Nine gets his own episode, so we'll cover it in his. All you need to know for now is that Michael lost and Othman won, leaving a large area in the top left of Anatolia open for Ottoman raiding. I, I feel like this, you know, because I'm aware of kind of the big strokes of the Ottomans doing quite well, shall we say, without any spoilers. Um, well, that is the first time I've used the phrase Ottoman raiding. And yeah. Yes, we all know how the Roman Empire finally falls. So yeah. we, this is end of days time, this is. Uh, Othman cut through the area, devastating it. He wisely left the major cities alone. So Nicopedia, Nicaea and uh, Brusa were just all left alone. Uh, but the smaller areas and cities and towns were plundered. One source spends a very detailed paragraph going over how awful the devastation was, painting a picture of people weeping in the streets, calling out for their family members. This was oh. nasty stuff. That's very... Uh, that makes it more human, doesn't it? It makes it more realistic. Yes, it's one of those paragraphs where you see and you go, ooh, yeah. <laughs> real people. Yeah. Real people from a long time ago. Yes. Now, it was looking increasingly likely that the Roman Empire was going to lose Anatolia completely. But then a letter arrives. <gasps> hello, sir. And it's from Roger. Yes, hello, sir. <laughs> this is my letter. <laughs> Roger de Fleur. Ah. That's his name. <laughs> my cousin. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Roger's cousin, Roger de Fleur, was born in modern South Italy, but at this point was part of the Kingdom of Sicily. Uh, and Roger de Fleur was currently the leader of the Grand Company of Catalans. In Spain. Oh, in Spain. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's in Sicily with a French name representing people in Catalonia. Welcome to medieval Europe, <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, the Grand Company were a mercenary army, uh, mostly from Catalan. Almost all of them were Spanish. Uh, the company had been recruited by Peter of Aragon to invade Sicily. You know, if you remember the end of last episode, mm. this is what brought Charles of Andrew down. Mm. And we speculated that Michael might have been part of it, sending some of his letters convincing Peter of Aragon to go and invade. Well, this is the force that did the invading. It was the Grand Company of Catalans, amongst other people as well. Yeah. But anyway, all that fighting's died down. So this mercenary group are now looking for work. And they looked around and they noticed a uh, Roman Emperor, Andronicus. He perhaps could need some men. He's not doing too well at the moment. So two envoys turn up at the palace with a letter. How about, said the letter, you pay us and we will sort out all your Turkish problems. You know, get that slice of Anatolia back under control. How about that? Now, Roger's not doing this out of the goodness of his own heart, or even just for the money, due to a checkered past, which we unfortunately don't have time to go into. Yeah. He had angered the Pope and the Templars. So if he could get support in the East, that would help him. You don't want to go messing around with the Templars, do you? No. So, Andronicus indicated that, yeah, okay, I might be interested in this. Ah, said Roger. Which, which one? expressive letters. Said Roger, Roger, reading out the letter from oh. Roger. Ah, yeah. sir. <laughs> ah. In that case, pay my men four months in advance, double the wages that you usually pay your mercenaries, and also name me a mega duke. That is fifth highest title in the empire. Mm. Oh, and also, said Roger, I want to marry a family member. Your niece will do. My niece? Yeah. Hot Betty. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, basically, this guy turns up from nowhere and just says, tell you what, I'll do some fighting for you if you pay us a stupid amount of money, you make me a mega duke, and you marry me into the royal family. How about it? Andronicus says, okay, then. He's in dire straits. Yeah, he realises everything's falling apart. Okay, yes, I need some men. Maybe I shouldn't have got rid of all those mercenaries <laughs> at right. the start of my reign. Soon enough, 39 ships arrive filled with knights and also their families. The wedding took place, although, uh, according to one story, Roger had to be dragged out of his bed the night of his wedding to go and sort his men out because his men had got into a brawl with the Genoese in the city. This wasn't just a small brawl. Uh, according to one source, 3,000 Genoese were killed. That's a heck of a brawl. That's a heck of a brawl. Um, no figures on how many of the Catalans died, but apparently not many, but there's lots of things. Anyway, the next day, Andronicus sees Roger and essentially says... 
great, you've married my niece now. That's great. Get out of my city and go and do things that I've paid you to do because you're just causing a scene here. Yeah. And at this point, one lonely Genoese just looks up from the pile. <laughs> Everyone thought he was dead and just goes, a scene? <laughs> you call this a scene? <laughs> yeah. So off Roger goes with his men. First up, the Karasid Turks. They're the largest, closest faction, remember. The Battle of Sisychus. I'm saying that very wrong. There are far too many C's, Y's and Z's in that name. <laughs> It'll do. Uh, no, took place. <laughs> anyway, this battle takes place in 1303. Huge success for Roger and the Catalans. Uh, the Turks were not expecting the experienced knights. Uh, they just didn't know what to do. They were expecting the weak forces that had been thrown at them before. But no, these are like knights in armour. And they look cool. Knights that can do stuff. All, yeah, and they've all got sexy Spanish accents and everything. Hello. So, fairly convinced that all of them are called Manuel. <laughs> so, uh, over 10,000 Turks were killed or captured in this battle. Andronicus heard this with delight. Yes, Roger's expensive, but maybe this will push the tide, reverse the tide, do something to the tide that's good. Roger's doing a good job. Uh, he then comes back to the capital. Just him. His men stay out on the field. Uh, Roger got to know his wife a bit yeah. and caught life a bit. Uh, but then campaign season was back on, so off he goes again. This time, he was interested in lifting the siege of Philadelphia. So, mm. uh, yeah, quite quite the commute. Yeah, uh, I was say. Philadelphia, obviously not the Philadelphia we know today. This was a city on the left middle of Anatolia that was close to falling. Uh, however... When Roger got back to his men, he discovered that his men had not exactly been disciplined without him, and they'd already spent all of their wages, and now were plundering the lands that they were supposed to be saving. So, not great. No. Worse still, they'd fallen out with Alan. Oh, not Alan. Yeah. It's been a while since we've seen Alan. Yeah. But yeah, we've got Alan's back in the story, hey. Jamie. Alan's. My name's Alan, this is my general, Alan. Yay! See, the Alan's are back. Excellent. Um, We're here to help you if we need. Or we can invade. <laughs> yes. It's completely up to you. Well, this was a small group of Allen mercenaries. Smaller, much smaller than the Catalans, but they had been placed under Roger's command. There's only three of us. And... I think that's okay. <laughs> that's all that's necessary. Well, We're quite deadly. They were only getting paid half the amount of the Catalans, and they found out, and they were not pleased. <laughs> I'm quite furious, in fact. They... <laughs> All three of us. They threatened to fill in a complaints form and send it to HR. <laughs> it was quite serious. Good news, however, after uh, the falling out, uh, Alan's got something. The bad news was it was cold, cold steel. The oh. Catalans killed 300 Allens. Ow. Oh. Not great. Still, Philadelphia, that's what they're there to do. Roger swept in and saved the day. Hurrah! Yeah. That's the long story short. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go over all the victories of Roger at this point, but it follows a pattern. He would go from area to area. He'd win. He'd push back the Turks, but his men last lacked discipline and often raided the lands that they were being paid to protect. So it was all a bit messy, but they were getting results. And then his fleet soon reached him. Roger had a fleet. And before long, he had control over a large chunk of the left of Anatolia, hmm. a much larger area than Andronicus had when he first started reigning. This was gaining land back. This yeah. was good. Uh, however, uh, Roger starts to think, literally no one in this area is strong enough to fight me. I'm cutting through the Turks like nothing. And the Romans have nothing. That's why they hired me. I mean, yeah. what's to stop me from just carving out a new kingdom right here? Oh. He thinks. Now, he keeps those thoughts quiet. He keeps on working for Andronicus, but he's obviously thinking about it. <laughs> Jeff, take the posters down! <laughs> Why the hell are you here with me? <laughs> You're such a turncoat. You're not from, you're not from Spain. <laughs> if he was to have a kingdom, he needed to secure the borders, he was thinking. So what he's going to do, he's going to head even further east. He is going to cross pretty much the entire of Anatolia, just squashing people down as he goes. In fact, gets all the way to the Iron Gates of Taurus that have been in the podcast forever. Remember, these are the mountain ranges that separate Syria from Anatolia. Yes, um, I imagine yeah. like the Black Gates from Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, they're very much like that. Uh, however, he needs to decide at this point, should he go into Syria and keep raiding as a maraudering tribe, making riches as he goes, or should he go back, as per ordered from Andronicus, 
keep the pretense he was working for the Romans and shore up his holdings. What should he do? Shore up your holdings. Yeah, that's what he decides to do. He's sensible. He turns back, not just to shore up his holdings, but mainly to go back to the city of Magnesia, because Magnesia, on the left coast of Anatolia, was where all his money was, and all of his men's money. And they just put it in a big room, locked the doors, and then left, and then said, no one steal this. All right? Look me in the eye. Don't touch it. Don't even look at the door. Face the other way. Yeah. Jeff, you're staying here because I'm not taking with you. You're a liability. Don't let anyone come in, especially if their name's Alan. Okay. Yeah. So, they head back. They go back to Magnesia, hoping everything was fine. Everything was not fine. They get to Magnesia. The city and the treasury had been taken over by an opportunist knight and a group of Alans. Who Jeff has now joined. Hope the opportunist knight is actually Jeff. <laughs> Jeff is leading the group of Allens. Oh, no. They have, they have taken the city and the treasury. We we really support him. I think he's been really great. We like his shirt. It's, yeah. it's grey. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, Roger de Fleur, not happy about this. That's all his cash gum. That's all mm. his men's cash gum. Mercenaries are well known for not being happy when all their cash is gone. Mm. Yeah. So... Roger sieges the city. Just realised we've got Roger sieging Jeff. Oh. This is great. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the capital, Andronicus is having a good news, bad news moment. <laughs> good news. His new expensive mercenaries were cutting through Anatolia like a hot arrow through a soldier. Uh, the east looked like it was going to be reclaimed. In fact, they might end up with more land than they had before. This is great. Bizarre. Bad news. Oh. The west, Thrace is under attack by the Bulgars. Oh. Yeah. The Tsar, Theodore Svetoslav, he had come to power on a wave of brutality. But he had managed to unite a collapsing Bulgaria and even push the Mongols out. Wow. Yeah, Mongols got everywhere. These were Mongols that went up over the Black Sea and were, like, coming in from that direction. Over? Like they flew? Yes, yes. Mongols were scary. Mm. Like yeah. bats. Uh, now, Bulgaria had their eyes on the Romans. Oh. Now, the Bulgars, if you remember, had controlled Thrace for quite some time in the past, and they wanted it back, they decided. So Andronicus sent his son to go and fight, but once again, Michael IX was not successful. Again, more next episode. So instead, he wrote to Roger with the word, Help! <laughs> if we lose Thrace, we're down to pretty much just Constantinople and Thessalonica and the lands you've gained. I'm going to struggle to pay you if that's the case. Roger's very frustrated, but realised the Roman Empire falling apart would not be good for him. He's married into the Roman Empire mm. now. It's, all, it's in his best interest to see the Roman Empire doing okay. He could always come back to Magnesia and siege Jeff later on. So, yeah, he decides to leave. He heads to Thrace. But then things get very murky here. It's, it's very hard to figure out what exactly is going on. The sources are not detailed enough. The Bulgar threat disappears completely. Mm. We have no idea why. As far as we can tell, there were no battles. So some kind of political thing happens, but yeah. we don't know why. Uh, some historians have suggested actually there was no Bulgar threat and Andronicus had made it up to get Roger to come back closer to the capital. Oh, that's quite yeah. ingenious if that's true. If it's true, great, but we've got no idea. That is just a theory. Mm. But it would explain why the Bulgar threat just disappears and there's no explanation yeah. for it. And there's so now no Bulgars, no Bulgaria. It's just empty space yeah. in Europe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the concept of Bulgaria was made up by Andronicus. <laughs> he went through and changed all the history books. It was very detailed. It's also around this time that Michael, Emperor's son, issued an order that Roger was no longer to have his orders obeyed by the army. Yes, he was a mega duke, but you no longer follow his orders. So they obviously had stopped trusting him. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I should say Michael Nine by this point is co-emperor. Well, he's been so successful, it only makes sense. <laughs> yeah, he has, hasn't he? Anyway, Roger responds to this by sending a note to the emperor reminding him, you owe me at least a year's wages and my men. And, uh... Mercenaries don't like not having wages. Unhappy they get. Mm. And don't think you can fob us off with all those newly debased coins that you're making at the moment, because I'm on to you. They're rubbish. Yeah, they're made of wood. <laughs> Down to 20% gold. They were nowhere near what they should yeah. be. 
So Andronicus looks into the treasury and finds uh, nothing. He's ran out of cash. He cannot pay Roger. Not good. And he also could not afford to make an enemy of this mercenary force. Yeah. So let's, let's talk to him. Let's see if we can make this up to him. In the end, it was agreed that Roger could be Caesar. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So, you know, another notch up. Remember, Caesar's not what it used to oh, be, yeah, uh, but it's still it's still pretty high. You know? so he's now fourth in line. Postal Roger must be so happy. It's like, I've got a Caesar in the family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tally her, this is wonderful news. And also, Roger, once he reclaimed Anatolia, he would rule that part of the empire. Ooh. Yes, this is... Andronicus being weak here, but you could argue, well, it was looking like Roger was going to take it anyway. Yeah. Let's say he can have it as part of the Empire. That at least saves some face. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see why Andronicus yeah, did it. Yeah, and let's just hope it doesn't come back to bite us in the arse afterwards. Well, let's hope. It was also decided that Roger would visit Michael, who was currently in Adrianople. And unfortunately, we don't know why this happened or who suggested it. Uh, One theory is that Roger wanted to get on Michael's good side. The two of them have had a falling out. Roger is now very high in the Roman Empire. So actually keeping the royal family on side means he's going to have a good life. Yeah. But we don't know. We don't know who decided that the two men should meet, uh, but they do. Anyway, so Roger goes to Adrianople with 300 men, just in case Michael's a little bit annoyed with him. (laughs) Anyway, they stay for a week partying until the very last night, the farewell feast. Michael... Got up and left at this point. Got a headache, gonna go to bed. Ah. The Catalans stay and drink. And they drink and drink until late, when all of a sudden, the doors are thrown open, and in rush, a group of Alans. We're here to kill you. If you could just stand against the wall in order of height, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> yes. They were still angry over the death of 300 of their fellow Alans. We are Remember? furious. Yes, remember, their, their Alans had died, so they were getting some good old-fashioned revenge. All of the Catalans, including Roger, were murdered. <gasps> oh, no. Now, it's not clear who ordered this, but Michael at least knew, because he got out of the way. So his father probably knew as well. Yeah. Uh, Andronicus had managed to rid himself of a dangerous man who was attempting to carve out his own kingdom inside his empire. Mm-hmm. However... He had also killed the only general of the only men who were holding back the Turks and the Bulgars. So, swings and roundabouts, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, can you imagine the letter from that Roger had to deliver with the news? Oh, oh, sir, I have terrible news. Oh, no, Roger's a professional. Sir, it would be I have terrible straight. news. Terrible news. And then he'd leave, and then when he got, went home, he'd just pour himself a whiskey, light a single candle. <laughs> and stare at it. Just stare for a while and then just flick through his postage stamp book just to calm himself. Anyway, back to work. Tally her. Things then go just about as well as you'd expect them to. (laughs) The Bulgars push to the Black Sea and take several port cities. Andronicus, with nothing to fight them with, just let them have it. Okay. The only way to secure a piece of that was to marry his granddaughter to the Tsar of Bulgaria. Uh, The Catalans then left Anatolia. There's no point staying there. They went and started raiding south of Greece. So in Anatolia, the Turks just moved straight back in. The Turkish tribes, uh, including the Ottomans, dominate the area at this point. Nicaea, so recently the capital of the empire, lost contact with Constantinople. There's no real safe way to get through anymore because you were going through Turkish Houtland. So it was an island city left to its own devices, technically in the empire, but not really. And things were not much better in this capital city because Andronicus had family problems. Ah. Now, as mentioned, Michael's co-emperor. And if you remember, he was a son from Andronicus's first marriage. The one who died in the zoo. Yeah. But Yolanda slash Irene was not happy that her three sons were not going to get anything when the emperor died. So she spoke to Andronicus, trying to convince her husband, why don't you declare all your sons equal heirs? And the empire will simply be split into four upon your death. And historically that works so well, so it makes sense, right? Yeah, that's a stupid idea, said Andronicus. (laughs) Look, look at this history not- book. It says, <laughs> the first chapter, this is a stupid idea. And it's number one <laughs> in the list. 
Yeah, uh, Irene was not happy with that answer, so she took herself and her sons to Thessalonica. She wanted nothing more to do with her husband. Oh. She went to the second city and just essentially started plotting against Andronicus. So Andronicus wanted to make it really clear to everyone. Michael Nine, my son, current co-emperor, is obviously going to be the next emperor. Just him. Okay? Yep. None of this nonsense. Yep. And let's make this really clear, shall we? Michael's eldest son, Andronicus III, will also now become co-emperor. So we've got three of us now. And it's a simple father-son, father-son deal. Yeah? No one's talking about splitting the empire anymore. Yep. It's going straight down the line. Yeah? Get it? Nice Good. and easy. Yeah. Yeah. Irene obviously not happy about this, but there's nothing she can do. However, Andronicus would soon really, really come to regret this decision. Was it a short, sharp realisation? Um, no, no, oh. not quite. Now, I'm going to be light on details from now until the end of the episode, pretty much, because if I go into details, it will ruin not just Michael Nine's episode, but also Andronicus III's episode, <laughs> and also the Emperor After Him's episode, wow. because all three of them are wrapped up in this. Right. And, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to be light on the details here and go in more detail later, but just to give you a sense of where this is going, uh, Andronicus Andronicus III was not growing up to be a good choice in Emperor, according to many. He was a gambling drunk who slept with anything that moved. He was said to be very good looking and he knew it. He was a bit of bit of a card. He was uh, just generally what we've seen before yeah. when someone is brought up in a royal family. Well, it's also why the, the, the family didn't own pets, because... <laughs> yes, dangerous. Uh, Andronicus II and Michael attempted to rein in Andronicus III by marrying him off, but it did not slow him down much. <laughs> no. Uh, and then, sort of, and again, don't worry, we'll get details in the next episode, uh, Andronicus III sort of accidentally maybe killed his own brother. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Just know for now that this utterly devastated Michael IX. Because Michael Nine had also just lost a daughter. Oh. And was also quite ill. Okay. According to the sources, the news that one of his sons being killed by his other son was too much for him, and Michael Nine dies. Right. The Empire is now down to Andronicus II and his grandson, Andronicus III. The fun one, the party emperor. Yeah. And to many, it became very clear that these two emperors, who in no way got on, would soon come to blows. And sure enough, they do. Andronicus III, young and charismatic and thrill-seeking, soon had most of the young nobles behind him. They didn't like the stuffy old man who was in charge telling them what to do. Now, two of these young nobles were Andronicus III's bestest, bestest friends. One was called John, and you might want to put a box around him. And the other one was Sir... Sergianis. Sergianis? S-Y-R-G-I-N-N-N-E-S. Yeah, that's how I say it. Sergianis. Sergio. <laughs> I call him Sergio. Yeah. yeah, anyway, these two had been given governorships in Thrace. I say given, they had paid for them because that's how corrupt the government had become. Now, they were not happy of the idea of having this governorship but listening to the old man in the capital. So, in Easter of 1321, Andronicus and his friends leave the capital and they head off and set up in the city of Adrianople. Here, the first thing Andronicus III did is announce that all taxes in the region are cancelled. Hooray! No! <laughs> he said lots of people. Oh, no, lots of people went, yay! Well, the people are living there, but the, I imagine oh, the yeah. people that collect the taxes and use the taxes are like, no! Yes, and everyone else in the rest of the empire went, no! Yeah, Andronicus III was a hero overnight in the region, as you can imagine. Yeah. Loyalty that brings. Sergio then led a group of men and marched on the capital. This looked like war. Mm. Andronicus II, in Constantinople, upon hearing this, realised that uh, this isn't good. This could lead to full-blown revolt. So through back channels, he talked to his grandson and said, OK, how about you be recognised as co-emperor and heir, because that hadn't been done yet, Michael was heir, and it hadn't been made official that Andronicus III was. So we'll make that clear, and tell you what, you can have Thrace to rule from Adrianople, but what? stop marching on the capital, what are you doing, what are you playing at? Now, essentially, this split the empire in two. Andronicus II had the capital and the surrounding areas, 
He sort of had the cities in Anatolia that were just about clinging on. And then to the west, he had Macedonia, with Thessalonica being the capital over there. Andronicus II, in the middle, in between Macedonia and Constantinople, he had Thrace, with Adrianople as his capital. Both emperors pursued different policies, including different foreign policies, which, as you can imagine, doesn't work. No, I, that's not going to make life easy for anybody. Oh. Yeah, if you've got one Roman emperor saying one thing and one saying another thing, yeah, it all falls apart. So the next mo- major blow-up was about a year later. Uh, Andronicus's friend Sergio was jealous of John because John had become the co-emperor's chief advisor. And because of this, Sergio decides to defect. Might have been because of this. Another source says it's because Andronicus III tried to sleep with Sergio's wife. So Who knows? Maybe it was that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, Sergio heads off to Constantinople and meets the old emperor. Andronicus II, very pleased to see Sergio, makes him a mega duke. And then he listened to Sergio just plot out his grandson's weaknesses. <laughs> just in case they were ever needed. Yeah. Several skirmishes then break out between the emperors. So there's no major battles here. It's known as a civil war, but it's all very light skirmishes. Everyone knows that actually having a massive battle is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> They're too weak to be fighting amongst themselves. Uh, so in the end, Andronicus II and his grandson decide to renew the agreement and say no more about it. Andronicus III is the co-emperor and heir, and also, here's lots of cash, you're ruling from Thrace. Fine. At this point, to make sure it was all official, Andronicus III was called to the palace in Constantinople, where a huge display was made of the grandson getting on the floor and kissing his grandfather's boots. Which just made it really clear, yes, we have an emperor and we have an heir. Uh, things settled down a bit. Tensions were a bit better. Uh, sort of, because then it became clear that Sergio was plotting to kill Andronicus. Sergio obviously had burnt all bridges by this point, because yeah. he just kept switching sides. Uh, so he was dobbed in before anything could happen and thrown in prison. But it did kind of sour the reconciliation slightly. Anyway, five years of an unsettled peace then breaks out, if peace can break out, between the two emperors. <laughs> It was decided at one point that Andronicus III should actually be crowned instead of declared. So mm. there was a big crown in uh, the Hajj of Sophia. I, I like the idea of a big crown, actually like a massive... It was. It was a big ridiculous. crown that was lowered on, on winches. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Uh, there was a slight hiccup, however, because Andronicus II got on his horse and headed towards the Hajj of Sophia. And as they were going, the horse threw him off. Andronicus II ended up sprawled on the floor. As you can imagine, many saw this as an omen of it, this is the end of his rule and his grandson's going to take over. And uh, this sort of was the truth, because within a couple of years, Andronicus II heard that his grandson was advancing on the capital <laughs> once more. Well, again. <laughs> yeah, now again, there'd been more skirmishes more recently, and in fact, they'd actually dragged in some uh, of the neighbouring countries, uh, the Bulgars were getting involved slightly, but again, nothing huge, no major fights, but it, tensions are riding high. And uh, yeah, Andronicus III is heading towards the capital. So Andronicus II sends his grandson a message, who by this point is outside the gates. And the message said, go away. Word came back, his grandson said, okay. Oh, that poster is well worth it. Yeah, that, that was that was good. Yeah. Andronicus II had decided on a different plan. Instead, what he did is he headed west, and he decided to take Thessalonica in the Macedonian region instead. And he does. He goes into Thessalonica, he takes the city. He now owns Thrace and Macedonia. Mm. Andronicus II only has the capital. Yeah. Still, some good news. The Bulgars, worried about the rise of Andronicus III, wrote to Andronicus II offering support. And Andronicus II jumped at this, and I quote, like a storm-tossed ship in the sight of heaven. So it's like, great, the Bulgars will be on my side. Uh, but no, more bad news. Oh. The Venetians have turned up and were blockading the Genoese. Uh, nothing to do with the Empire, no. nothing to do with Andronicus, uh, but it gridlocked the capital, food was not getting in, and people were getting angry. Those yeah, damn gondolas. <laughs> yeah, and, oh, uh, my grandson's on his way again, is he? Right, okay. Now, he was assured by a close advisor at this point, don't worry, it's just a rumour. You can go to bed. 
It's fine. Are you sure, said Andronicus. Yes, it's just a rumour. He was told a second time. It's fine. Don't have a nap. So Andronicus went to bed. He went to have a lie down. Yeah. He was awoken in the middle of the night to sounds in the city. He could hear noises in the street. And as dawn was approaching, the palace doors open and in comes his grandson. Ah, family reunion? Well, Andronicus too was apparently quite tearful. Uh, He knew what this meant. He was fully expecting his life to end. However, his grandson assured him, don't worry, old man, no harm will come to you. You will be monked. It was probably a pause. With my eyes? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Probably a pause. It's like, monked sounds good, but how much will I be able to see whilst being a monk? No, no, apparently you even get to keep your eyes. Oh, thank you. Then yes, I accept you are now emperor. So, yes, he abdicates very much Mm. against his will, but he does. And he goes into a monastery where he dies peacefully in his sleep, maybe, who knows, four (laughs) years later. With a pillow over his face, (laughs) four years (laughs) later. (laughs) Yes. And there you go. That is the rule of Andronicus II. Interesting. It had its ups and downs. I mean, a lot of downs, I'll be honest, a lot a lot of downs. A lot of downs, but he's he never comes across as awful, does he? No, that's the thing. It's just yeah. a few decisions that are questionable. Yeah, but yeah, at no point are you going, what are you doing? Yeah, well, maybe at the beginning with oh, the okay, army maybe. and the navy and stuff. And the mercenaries, uh, but, you but, could, it's like, but well, he we upgraded. But he did upgrade to a better yeah. mercenary set, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, we're starting to judge him, so let's yeah. jump into judging. Yeah. Fightius Maximus. Okay. Fightius. Uh, so, um... Go on then, Jamie. Uh, he placated the Arsenites... Well, he, he didn't placate the Arsenites, which is... Yeah, that kind yeah of he fought the Arsenites, he did, and thing. he did a reasonable job against them. Um, he yeah. introduced a new patriarch, again, political fighting. There was a, there's a, we say, he's a stylite with his movable yeah. wheels and the, the, the camel. Um, yeah, I'll give you that. The, I, I, I put Thessalonians, but I have no idea why. <laughs> That's good to know. Uh, but uh, in in a negative sense, uh, in terms of fightius, he disbanded the n- mercenaries and the navy at this point. Yeah. That's not great, is it? No, especially the navy, I think. Like, but should that be more successes rather than him actually fighting? Yes, probably. Yeah. I've never understood maybe. how this round works, but yes, we'll, we'll... Now, this is him actually going to battle. Yeah. Uh and he does some under his father. They were on campaign when his father died, remember? Oh, yes, he was. Yeah. So he did do some fighting, but there's not much in here. When he's emperor, he sends his son out. Yeah, he does. It's Michael. Michael. It's Michael Nine and who goes he's out and does all the He's like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the... <laughs> I'm joking, oh, oh, he's he terrible. Is absolutely amazing, isn't he? Yeah, no, he's terrible. Um, absolutely terrible. Yeah, it, it's not great. He just... He doesn't really do anything. No. The only success the Empire has is because of Roger. Yeah. And they end up having to kill Roger because he becomes too powerful. After spending so much money or potentially spending yeah. so much money, maybe they didn't get paid much. So, so. But I've got to give him a couple of points just because he was in the army and he did some fighting. And he's like, at some points, the Empire is successful in some battles. So I'll give him a couple, but it's not good. No. So two from me. Two. Um, I'm going to match that. I agree 100%. Cool. Four. Aprovium Cretium. Well, he's incredibly pious and loyal. He was very loyal. He was very pious. He comes across as very sensible. Did the opposite of opprobrium with the church. He made the church happy. Yes. Um, which made the people happy. Yeah. So I know we gave his dad some uh, points here for splitting up the church. I went to see John Ford, didn't he? He went to see John Ford, but it was dad who uh, stabbed the eyes out of John no, Ford. No, but I, I get... give. Did we give Michael points for taking the eyes out of John Ford? I have no idea. Why are you asking me? <laughs> I don't know, it was a long time ago we recorded that. If we didn't, we should go back and give him yeah, extra points for the, that. But the, anyway, the yeah. problem of that is he went to go and see someone his father had, you know, blinded and shoved in a but cave. That, that was to that was to cheer up the population. That was to stop discussion about how it was awful. I, I think that was a sensible political Yeah, move. definitely, yeah. Yeah, so I don't think he can get points for to that. Fair, he's not um, done anything crazy. No, no, he doesn't. Other than get rid of the Navy... 
I mean, there are the reason. There's logical reasons for it, but yeah, there was logical reasons. I it think wasn't you crazy. maybe should have balanced it a little bit more. It's like, well, invest, instead yeah. of investing in the, the the money into our army or navy, let's invest it in improvements. The trouble with inve- with investing is uh, you need money, and they uh, have none. The empire is true. broke at this point. Yeah, they really are. Uh, so, I'm, I, Twist, I, 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 I would feel bad giving me any points for this. No, I don't think he can have anything. I'm, I'm re-scanning my notes just in case I missed something when writing this up originally, but no, I think it's nope. going to be a zero. Zero. Okay, next. Success ultimate. Um, oh dear. <laughs> yeah. The Empire is shrinking mm-hmm. rapidly. But I, there's not many points I can point to and go, this is his fault, though. No, a lot of the decisions There definitely seems logical. to be a trend. A, there's a, an historical trend happening, and he is riding the wave. And if he was an amazing emperor, maybe he'd be able to do something, but he's not. He's mediocre, so therefore everything just gets worse. Are you watching House of the Dragon at the moment? I'm I'm going to wait till it's all out, then I'll watch it. What, like you did for Game of Thrones? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Paddy Constantine is playing uh, the king uh, and doing a very good job in that at the moment. And he comes across as like a, a decent ruler that is just not very good at being the king. Mm. He's, he's a decent guy. He's trying his best. But it, these are, it's very much the feeling I'm getting here from Andronicus 2. Hey, the, the, something I've not talked about enough, perhaps, although obviously I just alluded to it, is the economy is down the toilet. Mm. They are debasing the the coins left right and center trying to get a handle on it it's not what working at all if you were living through these times you would not be happy well that's part of successes you, isn't your, it yeah your wages aren't worth anything anymore the empire is in decline there's a bunch of spaniards and allens running around the place lording it over you and like stealing all your stuff whilst pretending to help you uh, yes you've got what you consider the right religion back mm. but doesn't put bread on the table, no, does it? But also you got inflation, because you got, by the end of it, 20% gold in a coin when it should yeah. be full gold, so you just, things cost more for the average person. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's not good. Um, it, it, he, the empire is worse than when he started, so you can't even say, well, status quo five. But equally, he wasn't so awful, I'm going, no points here. Um, I, I, I'm going to give him a one. I'm going to give him a couple. I'll give him a couple, because, yeah... He wasn't awful. He is getting shockingly low score, which is just depressing because I don't think he was that bad. But we've had this before. It's it's not. It's not fair. But that's his. um, He's it's point in time where it's some cookie crumblage. That's what that is right there. Um, Okay, that's three Three. then. Yeah. Oh dear. Right. Maybe his damn good looks will pull him through. (laughs) Image of face. Okay, we've got something slightly different here. Um, the image mm. you can find, it's the first image used on the Wikipedia uh, entry. And this is an image found in a manuscript that is almost contemporary. Okay. Um, it's like slightly after, but we, we are close. Um, so I, we can definitely use this. And it is a drawing, like with inks and stuff. Uh, it so, looks like uh, But different to the ones we've had recently... Uh, yeah, this is it's good. So go on, explain what's he look like. Um, he's very tall and phallic looking. Literally, he looks <laughs> yes, like he a is. massive phallus. Um, oversized hat on his head. Um, yeah. Nicely kingly old age beard. Halo. It's a very square obviously. beard. It's yeah. a very squared off beard. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, it's like it's big droopy moustache looking thing. Yeah, he looks a bit sad and wonky yeah. eyes. Um, He's got a halo behind him. He's got a massive yeah. cross. Uh, red, red, uh, sort of long thing with gold draped with jewels, obviously, and holding a scroll because he's a he's a, the law. And then a cross yes. in his right hand because that's you know the god and God's law or whatever. And there, there's no mention in the sources about the fact that one of his eyes is significantly higher than the other. No. So it's maybe just bad artist. Uh, or a crinkle but... in the paper. <laughs> Who knows? No, maybe it's a crinkle in the paper. And um, standing on like an alien, like, invasion, like an alien virus it's big, underneath. Like a sort of big red blob thing yeah. standing on with a bird in it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's different. It's unusual. We've never had something quite like this before. Mm. So, I mean, he's getting bonus points for that because I like that. Uh, I like his very square beard. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. 
Um, but it's also it's not great. So I think I'm it's gonna unique. go. I think yeah, it's points unique. of uniqueness. Um, I'm gonna go for six. Do you know what? I'm gonna match that. That is three for this round then. Okay, next. Temple complete. How long does he last? Do you think? I think quite a while. I'm thinking I'm going into maybe 30s, 30 something years. Um, yeah, uh, he he lasts quite a while. He becomes the sole ruler, which is where we're, we're doing it from, in 1282, and he rules till 1328. That is a very impressive reign because that is 45 years. Almost 45 and a half, if you really go into the details, but we'll round it to 45 years. That gives him one of the longest reigns in all of Roman history. It is seriously long. There's a reason why we're on the last dynasty, but we've still got like 200 years. Yeah, the, yeah. And there's only like 11 of them. Some of them really last quite some time. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, 45 years gives him a score in this round of 5.6. He breaks the scale because he beat Augustus. Yeah. That gives him a score of 15.6. That is that is depressing. It is. 45 years, and he doesn't do anything terrible, and yet he only scores 15.6. But, I mean, this is it. The The Empire's on, on its downward trajectory. It's, it is. Uh, yeah. It's all, all going wrong. Yeah. yeah. But only one question to ask now, though. Do they have a certain Gene Caesar? Uh, no. No. I mean, his length of rule is impressive, yeah. but no. But you, you can't judge impressiveness by length, is my motto no, in life. No. So Exactly. We need to follow this. And also, it's embarrassing losing a civil war to your grandson. Yeah. And having yeah. a... If we didn't actually mention in the rounds, it's like he there was a, a war going on in his own territory that he had no control over. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, there's that as well. That's just embarrassing, isn't it? So, yeah, no, definitely not. No Genesis. Uh, sorry, Andronicus. Uh, but there you go. So, next up, Michael Nine, mm. and obviously we've already covered his entire reign. Mm. Now, interestingly, it's debatable whether we should do Michael Nine, because it's like he was never sole ruler; he was always like the heir ruler. But he is almost always listed because he reigned for a good chunk of time. And actually, there's stories we can tell about him. So I'm willing to, to put Michael Nine on the list. I think he was uh, impactful enough, as we will see in his yeah. episode. I mean, whether his score highly is another matter. Uh, but uh, I think he certainly had an impact. So we've got Michael Nine, and then obviously we've got Andronicus Three. But also, I told you to put a box around his friend John as well. Mm. And then things just start getting messy again. Oh, the Paleologuses, they get a bit messy, they do. Yeah. But it's not too bad. We've seen worse. Yeah. Right, okay, well, thank you very much for listening. And thanks for downloading some Poppy iTunes, Stitcher, and everywhere else you download us from. Um, oh, those of you who did not get to hear our intelligent speech presentation about Hannibal's elephants. Uh, Hello. Uh, there's good news. Uh, we will be able to release that shortly. And I am very happy. If you didn't get to see it at the time, we saved the audio. So we'll be able to do Yay. that. So uh, that should be coming soon. Right, OK, then. I don't think there's anything else to say. No. Other than... Unless you wanted to say anything. No. No? OK, then. All it needs to be said is... I'm not dead! <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Enter. Hello. John. Yes? You may not know who I am. Um, no. No, I can't say I recognise how you look. Ah, yes, yes, of, of course. Well, I am the current, um, emperor? You're the current emperor. Oh, right. Well, please take a seat, your excellency, your emperorshipness. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. I shall sit on this, um, well, um, there's nothing here but a dung pile, so I shall sit on the hardened dung pile. Yes, no, please take a seat on my dung pile, by all means. Yes, uh, oh, uh, surprisingly stiff, uh, wonderful. Hmm. <laughs> yes, I, I hope you, I hope you enjoy my boat, beautifully decorated, uh, 
I, I assume. I wouldn't know. Well, yes, <laughs> quite. My my father was was quite the um, over egger of the pudding, shall we say? Um, eggs, yes. I used to like eggs. I used to like cracking the tops of them and scooping out the innards. Can't say I like them much anymore. Why? Well, yes, I, I I can see what that that what it would. Oh, sorry, you, you can see that, can you? Can you, I, Emperor? I can envision in my can head can why you? that would be. Yes. Uh, Please get case. to the point. Why are you here? To, uh, I've got to say, on behalf of my father and myself, I just need to apologise. I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. I. You're sorry this happened to me? Yes, um... This is an awful situation, and I must say that I am bereft with sadness, and I want to see what I can do to make your life better. Oh, well, I must say that is actually very generous of you. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad you see the positives. That's wonderful. Uh, Andronicus, is it? Yes, yes, Andronicus too. Andronicus, wonderful. Yes, no, there is a couple of things, actually, now I come to think of it. Yes, yes. I, I will do anything I can to help you. Well, you know, I'd quite like to liven the place up a bit. I'd, uh, I'd quite like some flowers. Oh, yes, it'd be wonderful to get some flowers. Yes, of course. Fresh flowers every day, if you need Excellent. it. Excellent. Yes, no, please, fresh flowers every day. I would like to see fresh flowers every day. Yes, of course, I'll uh, uh, get some fresh flowers for you to see. See. Mm. A a anything else? Anything else? I'll... No, no, that's it. This one thing. I want to see fresh flowers. Can you make that happen, can you, Andronicus? Well, I can... Certainly... Can you, Andronicus? Well, no. Then f Yes, okay, that's, that's, that's fair enough. Goodbye. Well, Dung, what a pillock. Ah, <sighs> chalk it up to yet another rubbish birthday. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, I can't see. Happy birthday.